our community. It's, it's been there for a while, but it, it's now got National Park Service uh, sanctioned as a national monument. I'm speaking about the home of Medgar and Merle Evers. Uh, Keena, uh, how, how did you come to be associated and involved with the uh, Medgar and Merle Evers home? Well, like I uh, alluded to earlier, my background was more Annabelle and South, and then mm -hmm. in grad school, I focused more on the intersection of people of African descent in the Southeastern Indigenous Nations and before the Revolutionary War and a little bit after. So you're speaking of Native American nations? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Yes, and, um, but I was, uh, I attended a workshop from the Gilbert Lehrman Institute called Stony the Road We Trod about the modern civil rights movement mm -hmm. where he spent a week in Alabama uh, and in Georgia, Selma as well, where some of those perpetrators of violence during Selma and Montgomery, March to Selma and Montgomery were still alive and giving us a finger as we, we drove by. But one of our assignments was to go home and talk to your family to see if they were involved in the civil rights movement mm -hmm. or what their experiences were during, the, excuse me, the modern civil rights movement. Now, when you say the modern civil rights movement, give me a, a, a context of years. Right. What, what are we talking about? So, um, some historians, a lot of historians, say that the first civil rights movement was to end slavery. Mm -hmm. And so, 13th Amendment passed ending slavery. That's the first civil rights movement. The modern civil rights movement, they posit, started the day after the Plessy versus Ferguson decision mm -hmm. establishing Yes, or establishing separate but equal. And then mm -hmm. after that, you have um, attacking the law, attacking everything little by little, bit by bit, until you get up to the point in the 50s and 60s where you, you know, you see the mass marches and, and what have you. But a lot of people tend to think of only the 50s and 60s when, in actuality, there were civil rights oh my God. actions yes, long before that. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I went home, and I was my my grandfather had passed away. It was my my mom's grandparents that helped raise me, and I asked my grandmother, "What were you doing during that time?" And she mumbled, and my mom was reading her paper, and she said, "Mama, tell her." And and my grandma mumbled again. She goes, "Mama was kidnapped by the um, the Klan tried to kidnap Mama on her way to a political meeting." Mm. What? Um. Apparently, she said, she went on and said that she fought so hard because in her head, she said if she got in the car, it was the cops who were right. okay. Right. Right. They were, they were the ones got, trying to put her mm -hmm. in the car. Law if she got in the car, she would no surely problem. die. Mm -hmm. And so the best thing for her to do was to go out swinging, and she went swinging, and it caused such a ruckus that they threw her out and mm -hmm. threw her up pretty, ba pretty badly. But um, she lived. But she lived, and after that, I just became so focused on the civil rights movement and it dawned on me that the civil rights movement was not big names. Mm -hmm. What we like to do in American history mm -hmm. is like, well, King was the yeah. civil rights leader. No, right. he was one of many. Right. And every community had their leaders mm -hmm. and foot soldiers and generals and lieutenants. Yeah, you know, um, we often laud and hold up in high esteem uh, many of the leaders of the movement, but the leaders wouldn't have been anything without the followers. Exactly. And and the followers were the ones who were in these communities where folks were coming into the communities trying to encourage them, trying to, to get them to rally around an issue or a movement. And and, and a lot of these folks knew that, look, I got to, when y'all are long gone, I got to live here in this community with these same folks that, that, that have been holding me down and my, my family down for generations. And I've got to find the strength to continue to fight them after y'all long gone to the next movement, to the next town, mm -hmm. whatever. It, it was it was not the actions of of um, uh, extraordinary folks who, who who did extraordinary things. It was ordinary folks who did extraordinary things yeah, exactly. that made that that was the backbone of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And and so I you know telling the story of, of the little guy or the little woman uh, in, in a, a community who decided I'm not going to drink out of that water fountain mm -hmm. anymore. I'm not going to take send my children to these substandard segregated schools no more. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take and let me treat me the way you treat me anymore. And and it, it was the, the little guy and that that story. You know, we, we like to look for champions. Mm -hmm. 
we like to look for Martin or Medgar or um, uh, Stokely or yeah. um, uh, Ralph Abernathy or but but uh, Randolph, April Randolph. But it it was those little folks who did the, the bake sales or the the, the the chicken fries to raise money for the movie. Uh, it was the, the little folks who, who denied or stood up to folks that that have been trying to make them uh, keep them as a second class citizen mm -hmm. all of their lives. Who said, "I'm not I'm not going to ride that bus as long as you, you try to put me in the back of the bus." I'm going to walk. I'd rather walk than, than let you treat me like this. And I will break your back, to break the back of your economy if you try to continue to treat me like this. And so you you might need to think about changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that's a, it's just such a, uh, such a great story of the resilience of the little person, the little man, the little woman that I love about the civil rights movement. Exactly. And I think that's far more interesting than telling these you know, big person stories where everything mm -hmm. is top down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the tactics that work in Mobile may not be the tactics that you need in Cleveland, Mississippi. Right. Right. So every place had its own flavor and its own challenges right. that you just couldn't do a carbon copy and cut and paste and, and do the same, apply the same tactics everywhere you went. That's mm -hmm. why you needed those local leaders and those mm -hmm. local facilities. And, and, you know, the the, uh, the style of Megar Evers was different from the style of maybe of Vernon Damer. Right. Maybe a different from the style of Martin Luther King, or uh, different from the style of James Meredith, exactly. or di different from the style of Stokely Carmichael, mm -hmm. or, or uh, Eldridge Cleaver, Bobby Seale. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of those styles had a role to play in, in getting us into a new condition. Mm -hmm. And so that I, I, I just love that, that about, about um, uh, how our uh, own individual strengths and where we found ourselves in, in the movement in Mobile or in Greenwood or in uh, Biloxi or in Jackson, uh, you, you had to uh, adopt a style that, that was effective for the moment and, and, and the time in which you found yourself. Exactly, exactly. The other compelling thing to me was that um, you know, we tend to think when we talk about these movements, even the Revolutionary War, everybody was involved. You know, mm -hmm. what sociologists uh, have mm -hmm. discovered that it only takes 25 percent right. of the population to actually to bring about major change. Bring about major change, and we see that in Revolutionary War, where the numbers are like maybe 33 to 50 percent, depends on which numbers you believe, mm -hmm. were engaged, actively engaged in the Revolutionary War. Same thing with the Civil Rights Movement. I mean, my grandmother was one of 14 siblings, and she really was one of maybe two mm -hmm. that were actively involved in the civil rights movement. Two of the, the 14 siblings in, in her family. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then moving here and, and taking on this job, not every African American was involved in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that could change from block to block. Block to block. Right. So tell us about, about the, um, uh, why the Mega Evers home and uh, why Megger Evers, uh, what, what is his import was in, in the grand uh, scheme of, of our history, and also uh, the import of Norley Evers in that same scheme. Mm, yeah, and, and again, I, I want to point out to everyone that the name of the home is the Megger and Murley mm -hmm. Evers Home National mm -hmm. Monument. Mm -hmm. As of this date, this is the only nationally protected site, civil rights site, that honors a woman. Well, we know okay. there were tons of women involved in the civil rights movement. Tons. There's nothing uh, nationally uh, available about Ella Baker, for no. example. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Not yet. Uh, Winston Hudson. Nothing yet. No. Wow, well, that, 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 I did not know that. Right. I did not know that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this is pretty well, special. Well, let's talk about Megger first, and then yes, talk sir. about Merlin. What's important about Megger Evers is that, you know, because of his style, he was so, he was a quiet guy. Mm -hmm. um, he wasn't always in front of the cameras when he was. He was making <laughs> surely an impact, and he was saying something that he wanted everybody to hear. Uh, it's normally you know, and it's very interesting you say that because in, in some of my research, I'm a history buff, I've tried to find speeches by Megger Evers. 
and they're few and far between that are that were recorded and that are still extant in our the the modern american lexicon and unlike king who had you know had this voluminous speeches and he had a record of and he documented his speeches they're not there's not a lot about megger he was very quiet he was a behind the scenes kind of guy working his magic you know sight unseen uh and and that that was part of i think the the magic of megger yes yes um in fact i play this game and i don't mean to be irreverent because i have deep respect for him but when it comes to mississippi i play six degrees of separation when it comes to megger and marley evers to see how many steps it takes me to connect to them for something and normally it's like two well i think that's i think you know they say that there's seven degrees of separation to anybody in the world right i think in mississippi is two two yeah